can you imagine that Sabbath? Jesus was dead. When we go back to the words of John, he said that the light shone in the darkness and the darkness had not overcome it. But it sure seemed that on that Sabbath, the darkness had snuffed it out. The word of God was silent. The source of life was dead. The one who made us from dirt was encased in it. Jesus' fall in the crucifixion didn't look like a fall that that he could get back up from. And that Sabbath held anything but peace for those who knew Jesus, friend or foe. If we looked at these people that we've that we've seen through this story through John's eyes, we we see what their despair on that, that dark Sabbath must have been. We, we look at John, and, and John saw that the end of love, true love, meant laying down your life. Mary Magdalene, she had just watched just a few hours before Jesus struggle in pain and mental anguish, nailed in place to that cross. When he himself had brought her such freedom and such peace, Peter, oh Peter, In the opening chapter of John, he says that, that Jesus gave the right for people to become sons and daughters of God. And then Jesus himself said, and this is eternal life, that people believe in God and in Jesus Christ whom he has sent. And a short time after Jesus uttered those words, Peter tells these strangers, I tell you the truth, I don't know the man. And he said it again and again. Peter must have been thinking all that Sabbath, why, why didn't Jesus defend himself? Why, why didn't he run? Why wasn't he stronger? Why wasn't Peter stronger? To have defended Jesus, why did he run? Jesus could have become king. But now, to look at another person, to look at Pilate, he stood so close to Jesus. Truth in the flesh. And he must have thought, if, if truth, if the embodiment of truth cannot stand up against the pressures that he himself faces every day, how is he going to find success? How is he supposed to win in the career, the life that he's chosen? Herod, I think Herod, that Sabbath probably felt victorious. I think he felt vindicated for his own embarrassment that he experienced the day before. Those that rejected Jesus, I think those that rejected Jesus on, on, by that lake shore or, or from his teachings in the street or 
that heard of him and and wrote him off as as a phony. I think they were thinking, look where all his teachings got him. Good thing I didn't continue to follow him or I or I would have lost everything. Just like he did. The religious leaders I think they were thinking that Sabbath as they sat down for their Passover meal, eating that Passover lamb. Good riddance. Cast the first stone, huh? We did you one better. And all the while, that, that smaller but more persistent thought, but what if? But what if? I think about Lazarus thinking about the one that restored him to life that he himself couldn't or chose not to? Why not? Just confusion. Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus at night to talk with him over his his questions of, of self and, and how could he be reborn. And then in the trial to, to not stand up for Jesus. And then hours before the Sabbath, he, he himself had been preparing Jesus' lifeless, unfeeling body. And his words of adoration falling on Jesus' cold, unhearing ears. And Nicodemus asking himself, why, why did I wait? Why did I wait? Why did I wait to tell him how much he meant to me? The man born blind. That had Jesus restore his sight in such an unusual way. I think when he heard the news or if he had seen Jesus in that trial or on the cross, he must have felt like he was entering into darkness again. And that woman at the well, when she heard the news, which I think traveled very fast, she must have been feeling alone in the world all over again, without the witness of the Messiah in her life. And asking herself, who is going to see my true worth now? Many of us today, we have the same thoughts and discouragements in our own dark Sabbaths of despair. When our hope flickers and the pain of our situations overwhelm us. We think about how Jesus did all those, all those things in that day in his day, and, he, and we know that he is still powerful today, so why doesn't Jesus heal me? So why doesn't Jesus restore my loved one back to health? Why did Jesus let my dear loved one die? Something very personal for me, four years ago, today as I share this, my grandfather passed to his rest. A man of God, still serving him in his second retirement, having sacrificed and given him his whole life to him only to come down with cancer and to go through 10 months of excruciating pain and and find his own body failing him to the point to where he even mentally wasn't wasn't able to be present and i it doesn't make sense he served god and and this is the reward that he gets this is the end of that during this pandemic and quarantine Maybe for you, the, the depression that you long battled or the addiction that you thought was gone 
the thought that you thought you had the victory over, it rears its ugly head again. You put in, you had put it in Jesus' hands, so why are you faced with it again? That wrestling that you have over, over your, your, uh, your own sense of self is, is, continues to bring you into this place of self-loathing and you thought you figured that out. You thought that you, you had confidence in Jesus and yet here you are wrestling with, with your self-image and your, your esteem and, and how, your own self-worth. Your relationship with your spouse or your kids, they feel, it feels like a losing battle. Fight after fight steals from you your hope that things will ever change in the future. But you prayed about this. Financially, you're at the end and feel like it's all falling apart. And, and you gave your tithe to. You were doing everything God wanted and you still ended up in a painful dead end. What is the deal? How can this be? How can this be the reality that you've ended up in? And I think that the, the problem with experiencing a fall, the problem with falling is that we don't expect it as Christians. We don't. We hear about the victory that we can have in Christ. We hear about his power and his might to come into a person's life and change it. We expect that the victory that he's promised will be ours. And so, when we fall down, when we find ourselves that we've fallen down, we feel like God has left us. When we fall down, we feel disillusioned. We think that, well, this is it. The only option is just stay here. I must have, I, I'm, God must not be with me. There, there's nothing, and if God's not with me, what hope do I have? When we fall down, we think that we have no hope. When we fall down, in that moment, we feel like nothing is ever going to change. To find ourselves so close to the ground after coming so far shakes our faith to the core and makes us want to give up. But... Falling does not mean that we stay there. Falling does not mean that it's the end. Falling does not mean that God has left you or that you are no longer his beloved or that you are no longer saved. In John chapter 1, in verse 9, 9 through 14, when speaking about Jesus, he says, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, and here's the clencher, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Our calling, our position, our success, and our victory is not dependent on blood. What we, our, our position in our life, uh, the advantages that we might have been born into, or the disadvantages that might be against us. It doesn't have to do 
Our victory doesn't have to do with the will of the flesh, how much we want it, how much we, we are able to achieve it, how much uh, we can do to prove that we are worthy of it, nor the will of man that we don't have some connection that brought us there. It wasn't because somebody helped us into that position. It wasn't that any anything internal or external gave us that victory, but it was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. The good news about Jesus that John exemplifies in his gospel is not look at the amazing things that people can accomplish. He doesn't say, he doesn't tell these stories to show how people can, can achieve a relationship with God because of them figuring things out. Instead, he shows how Jesus, in various situations, in various people's lives, very different life experiences, different ways of falling and messing up and regressing and ending up flat on their backs, Jesus is able to give them the victory in him. And that victory, in truth, looks very different than the victory that sometimes even the church teaches or expects. Victory in Jesus doesn't mean that, that we ride high, untouchable, the fire doesn't touch us, although that happens. Instead, victory in Jesus is what Jesus exemplified that he, he lost, that Jesus fought the battle and lost, and because he lost, he won. Because complete love is completely selfless, com True love completely trusts. True love completely submits to the path that God leads us through, even when it's hard, even when it's discouraging, even when it's dark. And, and Jesus, knowing this all the way along, did not avoid suffering did not avoid the trial. He asked God to please take it from him, but he said, but not my will, but your will. He knew in his own humanity, his, in his, the word of God becoming flesh, in, that, in what he was experiencing and feeling and thinking, he knew that, that his circumstances couldn't be trusted to, to indicate his relationship with his father. And that he had to continue to put his trust into him no matter what happened. And that same yielding trust, that same peace that comes from, from God in the submission to his will, Jesus modeled for us. He gave it to us. And he... And he called us to buy in to his sacrifice, his way of loving and living. And he did the, one of those ways is through this physical 
experience of communion that we do as a church. If you would like to participate, I would like to invite you into this ceremony of taking something as close to a, a, a unleavened bread as you can find in your house and something as close to uh, grape juice in, in your place. And we're going to take these symbols of Jesus' sacrifice, of his falling, of his failing for us to give us the victory. And in so doing, we are also buying into his example of what victory really looks like, what it really means to accept that apparent defeat, that to recognize that helpless state that we are in, to recognize that we are powerless to solve our own problems by ourselves and that we are entrusting, just like Jesus did, our lives into our, our lives and our loved ones into the hands of God, doing all that we can in the way that God leads us and to submit to the results, knowing that our suffering is not without an end, that God will leave us in that God will write an end to our suffering and that no, no, no pain will be wasted because of what God promises he will do for us and through us, through our experience. So I'd like you to, to pause this, to go get these things, to participate. You are invited to participate. This is a symbol of Jesus and his sacrifice for you, giving you the victory because of who he is and what he has accomplished. Father God, thank you for the, the symbols of who you are and how much you love us, what you've given for us and what you are, are eager to have us participate in. Thank you for your love, for your sacrifice, for the, for the abundance of grace and mercy that carries us through the dark times in our lives. Father, I'm asking that you, that you bless this experience of taking together, even though we're apart, this, these symbols of, of your son Jesus. And may we also exemplify that full, complete love that, that, seems to lose a battle, but that trusts in you all the way through it. That in our discouragement, we put our eyes on you and trust in you. Father, I ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. On that very same night that he was betrayed, Jesus, he took the bread and he said, this is my body that is for you. When you do this, think of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant which is poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. When you do this, think of me. In Jesus' explanation to his disciples of, of who, of, of their reality. He gave them these words in John chapter 16, verse 33. And he said this, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. 
May God bless you. And remember that God can be trusted and to love one another.